Good day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with episode 14 in Australia's Day of National Shame. Darwin 1942, the book of uh, Timothy Hall, Australia's Darkest Hour. And that uh, comment, Australia's Day of National Shame, comes from Governor General Sir Paul Hasluck, who was there on the day when he was later unveiling a memorial plaque to one of the dead killed on the day of Australia's national shame. Taking up the second half of the chapter called The Confusing Day. I would read down to there last time, I'll take back up here. Slight overlap. Illustrated from a picture on page 97 of Khaki and Green, first edition, 1943. And this is titled The Army in the North. And these trucks here and this bridge, that's Adelaide River Camp. Typical of the rolling tree covered northern country in which troops are living is this scene of an army camp in the Northern Territory by B3 98. At the Darwin Hospital, meanwhile, the Department of Health's Chief Medical Officer for the Territory, Dr William Kirkland, supervised the reception and treatment of the dying and injured who were brought in. He could call on three of his own doctors and three naval surgeons, as well as 23 sisters and nurses and six civilian volunteers, when the message was passed that all the women in town were being taken out on the train because a Japanese landing was imminent, so they thought, Ten of the sisters asked to be allowed to stay behind and nurse the injured. The hospital had only been open for a month and replaced a ramshackle old building that had stood there for years. A few of the old customs in the hospital died hard. Aboriginals and half-castes were not allowed to be treated in the same ward as whites, but it was a more efficient building. But it was not better in one of the most important areas for which it had been moved to the new site. Originally, it had stood close to the barrack gates, but it was thought to be too vulnerable there in the event of an air attack and was moved to the other side of the barracks. It was so similar to the barracks that on the 19th, the Japanese bombed the hospital and left the barracks alone. A steady procession of patients, many critically burned by the burning oil in the harbour, were brought to the hospital by police and civil defence workers. Sergeant Bill McKinnon, worked tirelessly through the afternoon and night, carrying stretchers, comforting the sick and aiding the walking wounded to get to the hospital. The medical teams worked ceaselessly until the early hours of the morning when Kirkland suddenly received orders to pack up his patients and staff and move to another hospital at Berrimer, 15 kilometres inland. The order from the Director of Medical Services, Colonel McElhone, gave them no time to prepare for the evacuation. His reason for the move was the fear of another raid at any time after the first light the next day. In spite of the danger, there was strong opposition to the move in the middle of the night by most of the doctors, and particularly by Surgeon Commander Clive James, who had performed many of the operations. He was concerned that moving many of the patients so soon after surgery posed almost as great a risk as the Japanese. McElhone, however, overruled him and the nursing staff, many of whom had been on duty for more than 16 hours under great strain and who were on their way to bed for a few hours sleep were told that they must go straight back to work. In all, 300 civilian and service patients, some still in a state of shock and others unconscious, were carried out on stretchers to the waiting assortment of trucks, utilities and ambulances. The walking wounded took care of themselves as best they could. One man was actually in the operating theatre when the evacuation was almost complete and with James protesting angrily, he was carried to a truck vomiting all over the place. As an aside from me, that'll be because they were using ether as an anaesthetic. When recovering from an ether anaesthetic, just about everybody vomits really, really hard. There were 50 rabbits and guinea pigs in the animal house at the laboratory which were used by pathologists for testing for TB, tuberculosis, and other diseases, and Kirkland went to destroy them before he left so that they would not die of starvation. 
To his surprise, the cages were all empty and he was on the point of leaving when a man called out to him asking if he was looking for something. Kirkland knew that the empty house opposite the laboratory was housing a group of shipwrecked seamen and some wharfies and he told them that he'd come to destroy the animals but couldn't find them. The seamen laughed. Quote, we found them first, he told Kirkland. We ate the bastards. End quote. By four o'clock that morning, the last patient was laid on a truck and the convoy moved out. But when they got to Berrimer, they were in for a rough surprise. Not only was there no accommodation available, bracket, it was a brand new 1,200 bed hospital, but it had opened for business the previous month with only 80 beds, close brackets. But the roof was now peppered with machine gun bullet holes. The whole point of being moved from Darwin, that Berrimer was safely out of range of trouble, was a myth. Considering that Berrimer Hospital had been built in wartime for war purposes, it could hardly have been more stupidly sighted. It was less than 1.5 kilometres from the end of a very busy runway at the RAAF aerodrome, so it's likely to have a takeoff crash land on it. There was an anti-aircraft gun position almost touching the hospital wall, so that even an accidental shot intended for the guns would be disastrous, and it would be extremely difficult for a fighter pilot to shoot at the guns without hitting the hospital. And it had only enough trenches for its regular patients and staff. The aircraft that had raided the hospital, most witnesses believe that it had not intended to hit the hospital but only the guns, was a Zero, that's a single seat fighter, that had come over at a height of 8 metres, 24 feet. As it fired, the bullets had thudded into the hospital wall and one patient who was too ill to be moved was sheltering under a bed and was hit in the back of the neck and killed. The Zero was one of those that attacked Darwin during the first raid. In charge of the Berrimer Hospital was an, a remarkably outspoken ear, nose and throat surgeon, Colonel Ernest Culpin. Culpin was a fearlessly querulous doctor who complained bitterly about the facilities that the doctors at Berrimer had to cope with. In the medical history of the war there is the bland comment that, quote, relations between the Army Director of Medical Services and other senior medical officers were often not satisfactory. In fact, most doctors working in Darwin agreed that facilities were poor and the whole hospital situation chaotic. This was when Abbott was the Northern Territory Administrator. Chaotic medical situation. There were actually five separate hospitals making up the General Hospital and their equipment, though wrong in, through wrong information and constantly changing conditions was spread from Darwin south to Adelaide River. The hospital itself was split into several sections that prevented it from functioning effectively as a general hospital at all. At Darwin Hospital, for example, military personnel were treated for everything except ear, nose and throat complaints and VD, that's venereal disease, i.e. sexually transmitted infections, and at that time gonorrhea and syphilis was pretty much all they worried about. Darwin was supposed to be a surgical section for dealing with battle casualties, but one surgeon refused to work there because the lieutenant colonel put in command of him drank incessantly and this lowered his already questionable competence. And not only was the hospital dangerously located because it looked so much like the barracks from the air, but it had anti-aircraft guns and defence lines right at its doorstep. After the raid, the headquarters of the hospital was moved to Adelaide River, as seen in the illustration which, if that were possible, was even more dangerously sighted than Darwin or Berrimer. Right next to it was the largest petrol dump and the largest ammunition magazine in the whole of the Northern Territory. And close beside it was an important railway bridge, as well as railway sidings where strategically important war goods were stockpiled. It's, uh, it's as if this human shield business did not actually start in Iraq in the 1990s or even in the German-Russian War, the Second World War, when people were putting um, prisoners of war across the front of the tanks to stop anti-tank guns from shooting at the assault. This human shield tactic seems to have started in Australia 
in the Northern Territory under Administrator Abbott the practice of putting hospitals right in the middle of strategic target zones in the hope that either the enemy wouldn't attack the strategic target because there was a hospital there, or if they attacked the target then the propaganda could claim that they'd hit the hospital and what a bunch of wicked evil barbarians the enemy were. McElhone was certainly a man who liked to have his own way. When the raid started, for example, he was sitting on the edge of a trench with another officer, Major George Plant. He could not see over the town and he said impatiently, quote, this is no bloody good, George, I can't see what's going on, unquote. So they walked to the edge of the cliff and from there had a grandstand view of the whole raid on the harbour without once attempting to take cover. In Darwin Hospital, Kirkland had arranged with McElhone that in any emergency the army would contribute an operating team to the civil hospital. But when the emergency arose, McElhone refused to send the team. In an official report on the incident, which severely strained the teams who had to manage on their own, Clive James said, quote, In my opinion, there was no adequate reason for the failure to adhere to this plan, unquote. It was McElhone who promised the civil, civil defence officials in Darwin his support when they had a simulated raid and then on the day refused to send his doctors, nurses or even an ambulance so that the whole important exercise developed into a farce. His excuse, quote, the Army Medical Corps has no business with civilian casualties, unquote. And it was McElhone who refused to give first aid lectures to civilians in Darwin, although he could call on 40 doctors. At Berrimer, Culpin's angriest complaint was that McElhone persistently refused to discuss safety matters such as the adequate provision of slit trenches. He put in numerous written requests and asked verbally, asked him verbally, quote, almost every time I ever set eyes on the man, unquote. And these quotes come out of the low royal commission into the bombing of Darwin, which was under the Official Secrets Act for 40 years. Culpert and most of his colleagues were so angered by what was happening to the hospital that they asked repeatedly for permission to go to headquarters to discuss their complaints or to put them before the Royal Commission. This was always denied and in the end Culpin deliberately went absent without leave so that he could be sure of giving his evidence. The army, in a frightening move, retaliated as soon as he arrived in Melbourne by ordering that he be examined by a psychiatrist who said he was perfectly normal and then admitted him involuntarily into a mental hospital. The army could then be sure that if he went into the witness box at the Royal Commission and listed his complaints, he would also have to say that he was speaking as a patient in a mental hospital. Now I vividly remember in the 1960s and 1970s, particularly the 70s when I was reading of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that one of the distinguishing features of a communist, Stalinist, totalitarian dictatorship was that anybody who had any complaint, however genuine, if it threatened the regime, they could be expect to be classed as insane and stuck in a mental hospital and filled up with sedatives and tranquilizers by the state paid crooked psychiatrists. And I grew up believing that this was an invention of the communist totalitarian sort of dictatorships. But here we find that in 1942, the Royal Australian Army was locking up doctors in psychiatric hospitals for saying that the Royal Australian Army Medical Corps had made a balls up of health services in Darwin. I am appalled at this, and it all happened under Abbott's regime. There was one medical centre where the patients had no reason to thank the medical services for anything. On Channel Island in Darwin Harbour were 70 men and women, Europeans, Asiatics, half-castes and Aborigines who practised no colour bar and indeed had no wards. They were the lepers. They watched the raid from their vantage point and the Japanese made no attempt to attack the island. Perhaps they did not know there were lepers living there at all. On Nauru Island, they put all the lepers into an open boat, towed it out into sea and then machine gunned them to death. Okay. In Darwin, the Japanese never had any intention to invade. Therefore, in the Japanese eyes, the lepers on this island 
were a burden to the administration of Australia. On Nauru, the Japanese had invaded and the lepers were a burden on the Imperial Japanese Naval Marine Corps. So on Nauru, they killed the lepers rather than feed them. In Darwin, they did not attack the lepers because they were already a burden on the Australians. This guy has a very, very tenuous grasp sometimes on the deeper levels of military strategy. When the raid began, the Department of Health had hurriedly evacuated the superintendent and his wife, but had refused to allow the patients to go with them. Now they were left to care for themselves as best they could. A few days after the raid, with lurid stories of Japanese invasion coming their way, the lepers decided to escape. They were led from the island by a coloured man, Gregory Howard, who was himself a leper, and in small groups he ferried them across the strait to the mainland. In the mangrove swamp they built bush shelters, helping each other with their incapacities. Some had to be fed, some cleaned, while others had to slide through the slime of the mangrove on their bellies. They were all tormented at night by the mosquitoes and sandflies. For three months they lived this way, supporting themselves on lizards, snakes and grubs caught for them by Aborigines, and on the food that had been left for them on the island. After that, they decided to split up with those wanting to go back to the island making their way across, while the others walked and hobbled on. A search was mounted for them, but they eluded it and people quickly lost interest. Then, in August 1942, six months after they had set out, an Aboriginal walked into Catherine carrying a letter written by Gregory Howard on a scrap of newspaper. It was addressed to a patrol officer with the Native Affairs Department, Gordon Sweeney, and told him to go to a certain place. There he found them all, except for three who were now dead. They had travelled 250 kilometres, and among those who had gone on were the worst afflicted of the lepers. As they passed through various tribal territories, the tribes had helped them on their way. But their journey back was not quite so heartwarming. The railway shunted their, quote, leper van, unquote, into the nearest siding, the patients were loaded on board and their remarkable adventure ended with them being hooked onto the back of the next Darwin bound train. The disposal of those who had died in the raid became a major problem and even this could not be carried out without controversy. As with everything else, there were no proper procedures or preparation for what to do with the dead and most bodies were either buried where they were found or were taken somewhere close, usually when the ground where they were found was too hard for a grave to be dug. Much of this thankless work had to be done by the police, who recovered the bodies, dug the graves and deposited the bodies in them. Where possible, the bodies were first identified. But if this could not be done quickly, little attempt was made to find out who they were. The condition of the bodies, the heat and the small band of people who carried out the work made anything else impossible. There was not even a proper record kept of those who were identified and the final death toll of 243 is almost certainly lower than the true figure. There were Lascar, Chinese and other foreign crews on many of the ships whose deaths could, not, uh, could have escaped notice because it was undecided whether they had died or simply run away. Many of those who were dragged out of the harbour and who had been burned in the oil were unable to speak or were unconscious and without papers. Often it was not even possible to tell what nationality they were. The Presbyterian minister, Christopher Goy, bracket, who later became moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Victoria, close bracket, and his Catholic counterpart, Father Jack Cosgrove, prayed together over many of the dying when they did not know a person's faith. And in the few cases where it was possible to hold a proper funeral service, they said a joint service over the grave. But most did not have a service at all, and this roused the ire of some people in the town. Thornton Hunter, the mess manager at East Point Camp, described it as, quote, quite disgusting, the way that men and women were placed in a common grave and buried without service or the benefit of a minister, even when they were recognisable. He complained particularly that Hurtle Bald, his wife and daughter, were buried without a service on the day after the raid, even though the chaplain was available, quote, to hold even the briefest of funeral services if anyone had taken the trouble to call him. By the morning of the 20th, the day after the raid, there were so many decomposing bodies piled up on the beach, most washed in by the tide, that they presented a serious health hazard. 
Burial for so many was out of the question, and Surgeon Commander Clive James had them loaded onto a barge and taken out to sea where they were put over the side. Perhaps because there were so few cases of bravery, apart from the sailors who went into the harbour to rescue those trapped in the oil, those few cases stand out head and shoulders above the rest. Constable Eric McNabb, for example, was singled out by numerous people for his extreme bravery and dedication. With his ribs broken, he worked all through the day of the raid, into the night, and then through the next day until he was so exhausted that he had to be ordered out of town to prevent him going straight back to work. Judge Wells singled out McNabb for doing what he called, quote, a wonderfully fine job, unquote, of attending to the injured and the dying, recovering the dead, helping those who were frightened and encouraging other helpers to keep relentlessly working. And there was another man who single-handedly treated 113 people for injuries and recovered and buried well over 50 bodies, most of them in the treacherous mangrove swamps. Charles Wilson, bracket, which was not his real name, close bracket, was in Fanny Bay Jail when the Japanese attacked. He had been put there by Judge Wells for three years for shooting the brother of his girlfriend and his sentence was almost over. He had been a corporal in the army of, at the time of the offence and a trained medical orderly and his commanding officer had given him a glowing character reference and described him as an extremely valuable man. Events would show that his confidence was not misplaced. There were 39 prisoners in the jail which stood on a ridge looking out across the RW to the RAAF and immediately behind it the civil aerodrome. It made it extremely vulnerable to attack and what was more, there were guns, mortars, ammunition and Bren gun carriers stored alongside the prison wall. Human shield tactics again. Minutes after the raid started, the prison superintendent, Robert Reed, rounded a corner and in the same instant a dive bomber swooped down onto the jail, its machine guns blazing and kicking up the ground near his feet. Reed dived for cover. The plane zoomed up and came back, this time with another dive bomber, and together they strafed the whole prison, blasting holes through the roof and sending bullets screaming all round the prison complex. Reed hurried to open all the internal doors so that the prisoners would not be trapped in one part of the prison, and shortly afterwards Judge Wells arrived and ordered the prisoners to be released. Ironically, several of them were there for killing Japanese pearlers, and as he addressed all the prisoners before freeing them, he said to these men, all of whom were full-blooded Aborigines, quote, Among you there are men I sentenced to long terms in jail for killing Japanese pearlers. I am letting you go. From now on you can kill as many Japanese as you can find and instead of a jail sentence the government will probably give you a medal. Among those freed was a huge tribesman from Fitzmorris River who had already served ten years of a life sentence for the murder of two white prospectors. He lost no time making his way back to his tribe and, like most of the freed prisoners, he stayed there. Ten years later, almost within sight of the place where he had killed the prospectors, he was speared to death by a young Aboriginal who coveted his wife. I find that a really strange segue, but it's in the book, so I read it to you. But it was Charles Wilson who most distinguished himself and whose conduct led Wells to say firmly, quote, I would be very disappointed if the Commonwealth does not exercise its power of pardon as recompense for his outstanding conduct. Wilson went straight to the ARP office and told Harrison that he was skilled in first aid and that he wanted to help. He worked until half past two in the morning, treating the injured who came to the ARP post and then reported back to the jail. Reed told him again that he was free and from then on he attached himself to the police. He toiled day and night for five days, seemingly needing no sleep. He worked alone for the most part on the beach and in the mangrove swamps, trying to recover bodies before the sharks and vermin accounted for them. Very few of the bodies he encountered could have been identified, and nine out of ten were so badly burned that the sight made him vomit. The majority of the bodies he found had been machine gunned in the back, suggesting that they had thrown themselves to the ground or the deck to escape the zeros. Well, once again, you've got this novelist's historical misgrip on the situation. 
if a friggin' aeroplane is heading at hundreds of miles an hour spurting machine gun fire at anybody, they generally turn around and run away. Okay? That's what they do. If they're really bright, they'll turn 90 degrees left or right and run out to the side. Either way, the brightest of all will find a hollow in the ground and try and hide under the projectile's trajectory. But yeah, most people turn around and run straight away and get shot in the back. Totally normal. Happens in every air raid from World War I onwards. Don't know why he makes such a big thing of it, but I just had to correct that or illuminate. Others had been hit by shrapnel. It took him two hours to recover one body from the top of a tree, but there were so many that could not be brought in because they were too far out in the dangerous swamp, including men from the USS Peary, the destroyer, but there were others which he almost died recovering floundering in the stinking mud of the mangrove with each step threatening to suck him down to his death. He was 26 years old and the Prime Minister personally signed the authority for his pardon. That's the end of chapter 14 or part 14 and uh, I shall return with the next chapter, the Exodus. Wobbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.